thank you so much, Jane, for that very kind introduction. And I would also very much like to thank both the organizing committee um, as well as the Wings for Life Foundation for the honor of being invited to speak to you here today. Um, so as you have heard, a major focus of my lab um, is to try and understand how inflammation um, contributes to the secondary loss of neural tissue um, following spinal cord injury and how that can exacerbate the consequences of the initial insult uh, and in particular uh, negatively interfere um, with recovery in lesions that are anatomically um, incomplete um, at the outset. Now, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and I think that's certainly true in, uh, in science and medicine. And so the idea to target uh, the inflammatory response following spinal cord injury is certainly not a new one or something that we've come up with. Um, in fact, that idea has been around for a long time. Um, but I think it's been fair to say that it's been very difficult um, up until now to actually try and translate uh, some of the really promising research findings from the laboratory um, into the clinic uh, and prove efficacy of these interventions in human patients. And so I think part of the, uh, the challenge or the difficulties that, that sort of like underpin that um, are the enormous heterogeneity that we see clinically um, in, in our spinal cord injury patients, which is obviously very different uh, from what we see in the lab where everything is perfectly controlled. Um, and you can see that illustrated here um, if you just look at these three cases of spinal cord injury that were recently admitted to the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane. Of course, all of them had a cervical spinal cord injury, but you can also see that they're all vastly different in terms of the level of the injury, in terms of the extent to which the spinal cord was damaged, uh, whether or not there was ongoing compression of the spinal cord at the time of admission, the amount of tissue edema that was present, and also whether or not there was evidence of actual bleeding um, in the spinal cord parenchyma itself. Now, of course, all of these factors will play a role into how uh, that person may fare or how well uh, an individual like that may or may not recover any function. The difficulty I think that we face is that we actually have very little tools um, or, or measurements available to us to actually predict um, on an individual basis where or how well a person will um, go on um, uh, during their recovery. And if we don't have that, then obviously it becomes very difficult to prove um, that, that a, a therapeutic intervention that we give in that very acute phase uh, may actually be having an effect. So I think one thing that we desperately need um, is better tools to, um, to assess the amount of spinal cord damage um, in patients uh, and to be able to better predict um, what, what pathway to recovery they may have. Um, and the opposite, of course, is also true, is that if you don't see any recovery, then maybe it was just because the injury was so bad at the outset that a neuroprotective intervention or a neuroprotective treatment was effectively doomed from the outset. The other thing I think what we should appreciate is that, you know, ever since sort of like the, the, the work on steroid treatment, we've come a very long way um, in terms of understanding the, uh, the inflammatory response to um, spinal cord injury. This is a hugely complex response um, in terms of that it's, it's very much a temporal response in terms of the type of immune cells uh, that appear at the injury site and when they appear. And what we should also appreciate or what we very much appreciate now is that inflammation is not all bad, that there is aspects of the inflammatory response that are in fact good um, and that contribute to wound healing and repair. And then there is aspects of that inflammatory response that we know uh, contribute to secondary injury. So I think the answer is really going to be that rather than using broad immunosuppression, um, what we really need to find is, in a way, targets uh, that we can more specifically hit um, or signaling cascades um, in that acute phase um, to uh, target these specific aspects of the inflammatory response uh, and also very much so at the right time. Because what we also know now is that a molecule or a signaling cascade that's active at one time may be injurious and a couple of weeks later it may actually be contributing, for example, to protective glial scar formation. So much of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is focused on this very um, acute early inflammatory response, in particularly in the phase where we see a lot of neutrophil recruitment and macrophage recruitment to the spinal cord. And I think the, uh, the broad consensus is that certainly when we're talking about neutrophils, that, that this contributes to a lot of secondary injury that we see. Uh, and also, as you can appreciate here, that at this time period where we have peak neutrophil recruitment to the spinal cord, which is about 24 hours after injury, there is also a lot of activation of the innate immune complement system. 
So without wanting to go into the details of that, the innate immune complement system is a very potent um, effector arm of our innate immune system. Um, it basically becomes activated. It be now not normally in response to microbial challenges, but we also know that in a variety of neurodegenerative conditions, um, as well as other inflammatory diseases, the complement system can become activated, and when it does, it can actually contribute significantly to inflammatory pathology, and we certainly think that that's the case um, also in spinal cord injury. What we also should not forget is that in addition to everything that's going on at the lesion site itself, in all its complexity in terms of the time-dependent recruitment of various cell populations, that there is also a huge um, systemic inflammatory response that happens. And some of this inflammation is actually taking place, or some of these changes are taking place even before cells are appearing in the spinal cord itself. So we can see, for example, this is some work that we are doing in collaboration with Dan Anthony's group in Oxford, um, is that if you look in the liver, um, you can see that already two hours after an injury, um, we see neutrophils appearing inside the liver itself. And what these neutrophils are doing is they're actually driving an acute phase response um, in the liver. So they're switching on the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6 and interleukin-1-beta, for example. So you can see here in the black bars going up. Um, and what we know now from experimental studies is that the magnitude um, of that acute peripheral response that we see in the liver um, is actually driving the extent to which we see leukocytes mobilized from the bone marrow. And that obviously has direct implications for the degree of recruitment of inflammatory cells uh, that we see to the, uh, the spinal cord itself. So one of the things that we're very much interested in at the moment is what the injury signals are that the liver is seeing, whether they're being humoral, neural, um, or even exosome derived, that is switching on this acute phase response. And then, of course, we can intervene with that to try and dampen uh, that systemic inflammation. Now, as I said, so a lot of this work, obviously, we've learned through doing experimental studies. And it's very difficult, obviously, to try and get to these things in human patients. Um, and what we can, of course, do is actually look at just um, registry data um, that we have and see what the systemic response is that we normally see to um, a spinal cord injury and what that information can tell us, uh, not just about injury severity, but also potentially patient outcomes. Okay. So the, um, the data that you are seeing here was derived from a retrospective study in which we looked at 163 patients uh, that were admitted to the Princess Alexandra Hospital uh, between 2012 and 2017. Uh, the vast majority of which were male, as we would expect. Um, and you can see that now, for example, if we look at the circulating neutrophil numbers in these individuals, that they are already above the normal reference range, which is indicated in gray here. Um, so they are elevated above normal already on admission to the hospital, and they remain elevated for at least 24 hours following um, admission before gradually returning to within the normal reference range. If you look at the circulating lymphocyte numbers, we see a different pattern. So we see that these numbers are actually dropping um, between one and three days after injury relative to the admission um, data. Um, and then there is a partial recovery again um, at seven days um, following the injury. And when we look at monocytes, we see that monocyte numbers are actually going up um, at one day relative to admission. Then they slightly drop down again. And then they go up again at seven days. So we see this more like a biphasic response. Now, obviously, with this sort of data, we are very much limited in that this is obviously derived from normal routine blood tests. So we don't actually know necessarily the phenotypes or the subsets of cells uh, that may be sort of like underpinning these changes. And for that reason, we are conducting more prospective studies now where we are actively banking blood from spinal cord injury patients and doing flow cytometry on these to better phenotype these cells, knowing what cells are actually mobilized, what cells are circulating, uh, and also what the, um, the activation state and also functionality um, of these cells is. But nonetheless, despite these sort of limitations, if we just look, for example, at lymphocytes and neutrophils, uh, we found some interesting relationships already um, in relation to just um, injury severity uh, and also patient outcomes. So the, uh, the drop in the circulating lymphocyte numbers that we see here is actually being put forward as one of the hallmarks um, of the systemic immune depression uh, that we can see in individuals with spinal cord injury. And it's being put forward that, that may, in a way, uh, make them vulnerable uh, to infections themselves. 
Now, obviously, when we look at the total population here, this is a subclinical lymphopenia and that it didn't drop below the, uh, the normal reference range. But what we've done here is we've actually now split out the cohort. So what we are looking at is individuals where the lymphocyte numbers stayed within the normal reference range during that first week in hospital, compared to those individuals where the lymphocyte numbers actually dropped down to below the normal reference range. So what we have here is a mild um, clinical uh, lymphopenia. Okay. So the next thing that we then did, because there's been some suggestion in the literature that there may be a level dependency um, to this lymphopenia and that patients with high level spinal cord injuries would be more susceptible, um, not of, of course just to infections, uh, but also to developing this lymphopenia because of a, uh, an altered or a disruption of the um, innervation sympathetic outflow to the adrenal gland uh, and also the spleen. We were not able to find such a relationship, however, in the cohort that we looked at. So if you look at those with higher injuries, so above T6 or below T6, you can see that uh, basically the instance of lymphopenia was about uh, the same in both groups. If anything, there was a slightly higher percentage um, in the injuries uh, below T6. What we did find is that um, individuals that were motor complete, so an AAS grade of A or B, were somewhat more likely to develop lymphopenia um, compared to those that were motor incomplete. Uh, but again, this is not like an all or nothing effect and we do see lymphopenia uh, in, in both groups. We also looked at infection um, susceptibility. So we looked at the, um, the number of adverse events in terms of infectious complications that these individuals had, um, particularly during the first um, three weeks um, uh, during their time in hospital, because we thought that would be a reasonable period following on from that, uh, that lymphopenia period. Um, and what we found is, again, that we found no difference in incidence in terms of bladder infections um, or pneumonias in these patients, compared in those that had lymphopenia, compared to those that did not. So obviously, we have to be very careful that numbers of cells don't mean function. Uh, but at least what we can say is that, at least on, on, on numbers, uh, that lymphopenia isn't necessarily a predictor uh, in terms of um, susceptibility to infection. One thing that we did find, which was quite striking, however, is now if we looked at those individuals um, in terms of like how well they went on to recover, and I apologize for the font size, but I'll try and throw you through the color code, um, is that if we look at the um, individuals that actually showed an improvement during their time in hospital, so a different positive conversion um, in their AIS grade between admission and discharge, you can see that that percentage was more than double um, in the individuals that had lymphopenia um, compared to those uh, that were the lymphocyte number stayed within the normal range. So that's obviously something that we are very much interested in to looking into further now, like what may be underpinning that. And to some degree, this would be consistent with obviously knockout studies in, in animal models, um, uh, for example, knockout mice, where we knock out B and T cells that typically also um, show improved recovery. Um, so moving on then to, uh, to neutrophil numbers. So what I told you is that circulating neutrophil numbers are very much elevated um, above the normal reference range for the first 24 hours. Um, and we find that that is irrespective of the level of injury. So you can see here that if we break down individuals in terms of like whether they had a higher or lower cervical injury versus thoracic injury, you can see that in all instances that neutrophil numbers on average are above the normal reference range. But what you can also appreciate is that they tend to be typically somewhat higher um, in those with a thoracic spinal cord injury. So we think in part that that can be correlated back to the severity of the trauma that you see in these patients. And you can see some evidence for that if you look, for example, at the new injury severity score as a measure for, uh, for injuries, uh, for trauma severity, that typically those with thoracic injuries um, have higher NISS scores. And that's, of course, uh, because of the actual damage to the vertebral column uh, and sometimes also some other um, comorbidities that they may have. Um, and again, you can see further evidence for that here when we look at the new injury severity scores plotted against the neutrophil numbers that we get this positive correlation uh, between the two. The other thing that we find is that if we look at those that were multi-trauma patients on admission, you can see that their neutrophil numbers were higher compared to those that had an isolated spinal cord injury. Um, and also what we found is if we look at those that just had a spinal cord injury only, um, that we found again a correlation between NISS scores and neutrophil numbers in those that were an AIS grade A or B, uh, but not in those that were a C or a D. 
So what this is sort of like suggesting or telling us so far, which is perhaps not that surprising, is that the severity of the trauma itself and also the neurological grading um, is, is directly impacting um, on the extent to which we see neutrophil mobilization um, in, the, uh, in, the in, in, the circuit, in the blood of these patients. Now, what we were, of course, also interested in is to try and figure out whether there's any prognostic value in terms of these early neutrophil um, data. Um, my wife is trying to call me, which is somewhat strange. I'm getting a sky pop up here. I hope you don't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> she knew I had a plenary on right now, but anyways. <laughs> um, so what I was trying to get at is what we were trying to assume is, or what we were trying to get to is whether there's any prognostic value uh, that we can see in terms of like how these early circulating neutrophil numbers may relate to how that person might be faring later on. And um, again, we do seem to see some, uh, some evidence for that. So if we look at those in which we see a positive conversion in the AIS grade between admission and discharge, you can see that typically they would have presented with lower neutrophil numbers at the outset compared to those in which we did not see a positive conversion. Now, you may obviously argue that's probably because of the severity of that trauma or the injury at the outset, but if we do correct this data set for NISS score um, and also the neurological grading, um, as well as the sex and the age of these individuals, that correlation still, I mean, uh, st is still retained. So that's probably clinically the closest or the best that we can get to in terms of saying that probably these mobilized neutrophils are doing further damage um, in the spinal cord. And I'll show you some direct evidence for that uh, in a moment in experimental animal studies. The other thing that we notice, and this sort of like further corroborates the idea that neutrophils really are bad news when it comes to spinal cord injury and inflammation, is that there is this subgroup of patients for reasons that we don't understand yet, it's about 15 to 20 percent of individuals, where the neutrophil numbers are actually never uh, going to outside the normal reference range. So what you can see here is that all the way through from admission up to seven days after the injury, um, these individuals don't see this, show this typical neutrophilia um, at the level of the blood. So we term these ones the non-responders versus the responders. Um, and we can't really explain this based on, let's say, the trauma severity, because you can see here that if you look at those with multi-trauma, um, that the NISS scores were about the same. Um, if you look at those with an isolated spinal cord, injury, there was a somewhat of a difference, uh, but not, nothing really to the extent that you would be able to think that that would explain, um, in a way, the fact of a person being a non-responder. Interestingly, however, what we do find is that if we now look again at those that were a neutrophil non-responder, you can again see that the conversion rate in terms of percentages in that group was much greater compared to those that were a neutrophil responder. So again, that would go to the idea uh, that neutrophils would be contributing substantially uh, to secondary injury following spinal cord injury, at least in anatomically incomplete lesions. Now, the thing that we can then do, of course, we can now take these findings to the lab and we can try and get more to causality and directly test some of these, uh, these ideas. So we, we do that by using the infinite horizon um, impact device. So what we do here is we'll basically open up a mouse. Uh, we'll then um, inflict a contusion injury with this particular device here. Uh, so the injury is coming in from the dorsal side. So you can see the extent of the injury here. So this is a force controlled injury device. So we can very precisely model both the severity um, of the injury and also the extent of tissue compression. Um, and the other important thing that we get with this model is that we get very precise readouts um, of the injury that was actually inflicted. So what we can do is, and that's obviously a luxury that we have in the lab, not clinically, is very controlled studies in that every mouse that we work with is basically the same as all the other mice that are in the same study. So when we do then a study and we then employ flow cytometry to look at the blood of these animals and see what changes that we can see in the level of the blood, first of all, what we can see is that in mice, um, what we get is the same what we see in people, um, is that we get this acute neutrophilia response uh, to a spinal cord injury. So we see an increase in the number of neutrophils at the level of the blood. And I'm showing you here two different mouse lines. One is basically a normal wild type animal. The other one is a, is a, is a genetically modified animal that lacks a particular receptor, which is a receptor for complement component C3A. And as a result of that deficiency, these mice show an exacerbated neutrophilia response. 
response. So what they do is they mobilize an excess of neutrophils um, in response to injury. And it's only neutrophils. They don't mobilize any other cells. Um, and also they're obviously, as you can see here, uh, they are normal at baseline. So in a way, we can now, we have a sort of like a comparison where we have these animals where we see a normal neutrophilia response, and we have these animals in which we have this exacerbated neutrophilia response similar to, or this really high neutrophil mobilization response similar to what you see, for example, in, in some patients. We were able to show that these neutrophils are mobilized from the bone marrow, which is what you would expect. Um, and then what we also did as part of a screen, we actually figured out what the critical chemokine was that gets these cells effectively out of the bone marrow. And that factor is the chemokine CXCL1, which is, a, is an inflammatory um, cytokine. And what you can see here um, is that that, uh, that, signal, that's, uh, that cytokine signals via its receptor, which you can probably forget about the name straight away, it's called CXCR2, which we have a drug against, so we can block that receptor. And you can see that when we do that, so if you look at this sort of like an, a non-treated animal versus one where we've blocked this signaling, you can see that we can completely stop this mobilization of these cells out of the bone marrow um, into the blood. And you can see that we can do that in both the normal animals as well as in the animals in which we had that exacerbated neutrophilia response. So you can see here that these animals are also, we have a complete block of this neutrophil mobilization and that we don't see these cells of the blood. And then obviously we would expect to find them back in the bone marrow. And that is exactly um, what, what, we, what we see. Okay. So the next question, so now we know in a way the signal what drives these cells out of the bone marrow. The next question, of course, is well, how can we now prove that these cells are indeed contributing um, to secondary injury? And so what we did here um, is we actually now used an antibody that specifically targets neutrophils and depletes them. Okay? And if you just focus on here, you can see that in both these wild type, these normal animals and the animals with the exacerbated neutrophil response, the neutrophil population is shown in blue here uh, in the normal control treatment. And you can see that once we treat with that neutrophil targeting antibody, uh, that that population is now gone. So now we have a scenario where the neutrophils are depleted, and you can see that they remain depleted for at least um, 72 hours, so three days at both the level of the blood, uh, the level of the bone marrow, as well as the spleen. And also when we look now inside the spinal cord itself, um, you can see that in those animals where the neutrophils were depleted, that we have a reduction in the inflammatory infiltrate um, in, in these cells. So what about function? So if we now look at these animals, and what we are effectively doing here is, a, is an Asia exam on a mouse, uh, where a nine is normal locomotion, a zero means total paralysis. And so what we see is that, of course, after a spinal cord injury, that all of these animals exhibit near complete paralysis at one day following the injury. The animals are now in spinal shock. And as they start to come out of spinal shock, we see this gradual recovery of locomotive function that is directly proportional to the severity of the injury that we inflicted. And um, so you typically see that they would sort of like um, plateau out somewhere between a score of three and five, dependent on the condition that we are looking at. Now, the thing to appreciate here is that if we just look at sort of like these endpoint results here, is that you can see that the mice that had the exacerbated neutrophil response, which are shown in red here, that they have significantly lower motor scores uh, compared to those um, that, um, uh, that had a lower neutrophil mobilization response. What we can also see is that in the case where we take the neutrophils out, which are the top lines here, that now again we see an improvement over normal in terms of like what the locomotor recovery of these animals is. Okay? So what we can deduce from this is two things. That first of all, one, that the extent of neutrophil mobilization is directly proportional to the outcome of these animals. And when we actually take the neutrophils out, we see an improved functional recovery of these animals. Now, function, of course, always should go in parallel with anatomy. So when we actually look at anatomical differences in the spinal cord, and we're particularly looking at sparing of uh, the ventral lateral white matter here, which is where all the important locomotor pathways are located, you can see that in the animals with the exacerbated neutrophilia response, there is less white matter left. And you can also see that when we've depleted the neutrophils, that we see now an increase um, in white matter preservation. Now, you may think, well, what does a one-point or a two-point difference mean for an animal like this in terms of function? And basically, you can see that here when we place these, oops, uh, when we place these animals on a, this was working just before. Oh, 
for some reason, the movies have stopped working. Anyways, the point that I was going to show you is that the animals that um, um, that have the improved recovery um, actually do profoundly better in this what we call the tapered latch beam task. The point that I also wanted to make is what does it mean for people? Probably I would say nothing. Okay, and that is because I think obviously quadrupedal locomotion in animals is vastly different to what we in terms of bipedal locomotion. But what should obviously mean something is what we can achieve uh, in terms of tissue preservation, in terms of anatomical um, outcome measures. Okay, and so the function that we see in these animals, I think, is nothing but just a readout to say our intervention did something to these animals, being it making them better or making them worse. And really, I think in, from from a clinical or a translational perspective, we should really be focused on what extents of tissue preservation that we see in terms of reduction of lesion sizes uh, and sparing of pathways. And we were quite encouraged, actually, when this paper came out um, earlier this year from um, Wrigley and colleagues, which showed that if you look at individuals um, with, that were classed as being uh, Asia A, so they had complete motor sensory injury, um, that if you stimulate these individuals um, on the foot, uh, that actually you can still evoke a, a, an fMRI response in all the anatomically correct regions um, in the brain in about 50% of individuals, even though they are not actually able um, to detect um, that, that response or that, that, sim that response obviously themselves. What this means, though, however, I think is that there is significant preservation of tissue in a vast majority of individuals. And really, I think that highlights the point, the importance of trying to preserve um, as much of that tissue as possible um, from the outset. And we think, obviously, that neutrophils are playing a major role um, in, in that tissue loss that normally um, occurs. So the question then obviously becomes, well, if we go back to the beginning and saying, well, how or what aspect of inflammation are we now going to target? And I think that depletion of neutrophils in a clinical setting would probably be a pretty bad idea, um, particularly because obviously these cells have important roles, for example, in relation to host defense. And so if we deplete these cells in a population that's already at risk of developing infections, uh, I think we probably would see a lot of adverse um, outcomes. So I think the the, the, the trick order is really going to be to, to really not deplete these cells, but to target them and modulate them in such a way that we effectively change their function, that they can still respond to infectious stimuli, uh, but that they're modulated in such a way that they reduce um, effectively the harm that they would otherwise cause um, in the spinal cord itself. So the treatment that we've been working on um, is basically one that we refer to as intravenous immunoglobulin therapy, which is not an immunosuppressive treatment. So um, in that it, it, it obviously modulates the function of the immune system, but it doesn't suppress uh, the immune system as, as such, for example, as things like steroid treatment would do. So for those of you that are not familiar with what intravenous immunoglobulin therapy is, it's basically a liquid formulation of um, immunoglobulins that are purified from the plasma of uh, human healthy human donors. Um, they get pulled from about a thousand different plasma samples of individuals. Um, it contains mostly uh, uh, polyclonal immunoglobulin type G, about 98%. It's in a monomeric or a non-aggregated form. And then there's also trace amounts of IgA and IgM present um, in the formulation. The good thing about, I, about IVIG is that it's already clinically used as an antibody um, replacement therapy, for example, so to boost the immune function in immunocompromised individuals. Um, and also there is a wealth of literature um, on both its safety and its efficacy um, from its application in, in autoimmune conditions, for example, including neurological disorders like MS and also Guillain-Barre syndrome. So the question that we pose to ourselves is basically whether we can um, see or whether we can test if IVIG can also target the harmful aspects of inflammation um, in spinal cord injury um, and whether we can then obviously hopefully translate that back to the clinic. So the first thing that we um, ascertained, and this is uh, published now uh, about two years ago, is that if we administer um, immunoglobulins intravenously, that we can detect them um, in the spinal cord. So you can see that they're able to enter into the damaged area. You don't see them in normal non-injured control animals. You can see that these immunoglobulins associate with a variety of neural cells. We don't yet fully understand what the significance of these interactions is. That's something that we are now actively investigating with the funding. Uh, 
um, that we have from the Wings for Life Foundation. But the most important thing from the, uh, from the, uh, to take away from the talk today um, is that if we now look at the functional recovery of these animals, you can see that if we use low-dose IVIG therapy, we get no improvement in outcome. But as we are starting to increase the dose towards the clinically relevant dose range, so about 0.5, 1, and 2 grams per kilogram, that consistently we get an improvement in terms of locomotor scores in these animals um, over the, uh, the, the baseline control. Um, we were also able to show that if we now employ advanced um, imaging techniques, so diffusion tensor imaging techniques, that obviously normally what we can see if we look at the ventral lateral white matter, that there is substantial damage to the fiber tracts there. You can see the lesion site, the central lesion site in blue here. You can also see that the dorsal columns in this case, so that's where the impact came from, is almost like completely disrupted in these, um, in these subjects. Um, and you can see now that when we give the IVIG therapy, that there was appeared to be a very clear effect in preserving the tissue, uh, both in the ventral lateral white matter, um, as well as in the dorsal column regions itself. And also the lesion volumes appear to be significantly smaller. And I'll show you some actual evidence for that in a moment. Um, in terms of the, uh, the tractography data, we were able to show that if we look at uh, neurofilament staining um, at and around the lesion site, and hopefully you can appreciate that, um, that in the, um, in the IVIG-treated animals, there was quite a lot more nerve fibers that were preserved and seemed to be traversing still the injured area of the cord, uh, but also that's in the dorsal column region. Same for the, uh, the ventral lateral white matter, we found changes. Um, and most importantly, I think if we go to more robust functional me um, outcome measures, so if we look, for example, like at lesion volumes, uh, you can see that typically these were much greater in the non-treated animals uh, compared to those that received um, IVIG therapy. Um, again, we quantify that, so you can see the quantification results of that here, with low-dose IVIG therapy having no effect uh, in terms of preserving the amount of white matter that we see in these animals. But you can see that there is a significant increase in the amount of um, myelin preservation, so white matter preservation, um, in the ventral lateral parts of the spinal cord of these animals that received IVIG therapy within the effective dose range. And that's obviously something that's, that goes directly hand in hand. So when we see a functional improvement, typically we would expect to see anatomical evidence for that um, in these regions of the cord. We also found that the lesion volumes of these mice were significantly smaller um, for those that got IVIG therapy at the effective dose range, as well as the length of the injury. Um, and also when we look at the amount of scar tissue formation, so if we look at gliosis, um, you can see that that was significantly reduced um, in animals that received IVIG therapy um, within the effective dose range. Now, obviously, these animals are getting quite a lot of intravenous immunoglobulin. So it's 0.5 or 1 or 2 grams per kilogram, which is really like a very high dose. Uh, but that's obviously what we, what we use clinically um, in, in conditions as well. So we then sort of like wondered, so in terms of like, well, how is IVIG now improving the recovery of these animals? Sort of like, what aspect is it actually targeting? And this is still very much a work that's ongoing. But one thing that we have already been able to show um, is that it's not just an effect of protein loading. So what we have done here um, is that in addition to IVIG, we treated a separate cohort of animals where we basically just gave an equimolar dose of albumin to basically match that as a control for the amount of protein that we put in. And what we see that in all instances, irrespective of whether we look at the functional outcome of these animals, whether we look at the amount of tissue preservation, whether we look at the uh, lesion volumes um, or lesion length, um, as well as scar formation and inflammation, that in all instances, um, IVIG therapy was superior to albumin. Uh, and really the most striking difference was that albumin did not um, reduce the inflammatory infiltrate at the lesion site, uh, whereas IVIG did. So when we looked into this a little bit further, um, what we can see that if we now look at endpoints, this is now 42 days um, following injury, um, you can see that it's typically the endpoint in animal studies because the neurological recovery is plateaued by now. Um, you can see that in the animals that um, did not receive IVIG therapy, that there's a lot of phagocytically active macrophages there that are uh, present in the spare tissue. Um, they are phagocytically active because they express CD68. 
And you can see that that's quite dramatically reduced, and you can see the quantification here um, in animals that receive the IVIG therapy, which is obviously consistent with the, um, the other histological outcomes that we had. If we look at more molecular biomarkers, what we found is that the um, uh, complement activation, which is one that was of major interest to us because it acts very early, and we know that that can actually substantially contribute um, to tissue pathology. You can see that complement activation, and you can see some evidence for that here. So if you just look at normal animals compared to those that had an SCI, uh, but that did not get the treatment, you can see that, for example, if you look at these two complement activation products, which are C5A and C3B, you can forget about those names straight away. Uh, but basically, that these, uh, the, the levels of these are, are increased um, as a result of spinal cord injury. And you can also see that with the IVIG therapy, we're actually bringing down the levels of these complement activation products um, in the spinal cord itself. Now, we think that particularly this decrease in C5A levels is very important to the mechanism of IVIG. And we think that because in previous work, what we found is that the C5A receptor, so the molecule, the receptor molecule that the C5A that we've decreased here is binding to, is key to driving a lot of the inflammatory cytokine production within the spinal cord itself. And you can see here that, for example, the animals that lack the C5A receptor have a blunted response in this chemokine CXCL1 that I referred to earlier, which is very important for neutrophil mobilization and recruitment. Uh, but also, if we look at other inflammatory cytokines, so for example, interleukin 1 beta um, and um, IL-6, you can see that the animals that lack C5A signaling typically have this attenuated um, cytokine response. So the next thing that we can then, of course, do is we can say, well, OK, all of this is still correlative evidence. So now what we did is we went back and we did more animal studies where we now basically went in and we say, OK, well, if we think that this C5A signaling is really important, what we can do excuse me, what we can do now is actually come back in and now give a treatment with an antibody that we refer to as BB5.1 in the mouse world. And this is, as some of you may know, the clinical equivalent of acaluzumab, which is a blocking antibody against C5. And so what this antibody does is when it binds C5, it prevents that protein from being activated. So now it can't be cleaved anymore, and so you can't make C5A anymore. Okay? And so what you can see here is that in the animals where we prevented this complement system activation, so where we prevented the generation of C5A, what you can see again is that these animals are now substantially better uh, in terms of their recovery from spinal cord injury. If you look how that relates to IVIG, you can see that it's pretty much the same. And if we now combine the two treatments, which you would expect that if they're in the same pathway, uh, that we wouldn't see any additive benefit, and that is exactly what we found. So this is suggestive, at least, that, or the, probably the, the strongest suggestion we can have at present, that this attenuation of complement system activation is one of the core mechanisms via which IVIG therapy works um, in acute spinal cord injury. So we've shown it in open field locomotor tests. Um, and also in the, uh, the tape at Let's Beanwalk, which I'd hope to show you the movies about, again, where we can see significant improvements uh, with both complement inhibition um, as well as with um, IVIG therapy. So whilst our studies on, obviously, the mechanism of um, how IVIG exactly works are ongoing, um, the advantage of that we have, obviously, is when we are working with drugs that are already in clinical use, um, is that the pathway to translation can be very fast. And so when the opportunity came along through a grant from CSL Bearing, uh, we've now been able to push this into the clinical trial states. Um, so um, this trial is now recruiting at the Princess Alexandra Hospital um, in Brisbane. Um, so it's our major inclusion criteria is uh, that it's obviously a very early stage trial. It's phase 1, 2A. Uh, but mainly we're looking at safety and feasibility as well as some of the pharmacokinetics um, and hopefully get some exploratory data on, on recovery. Uh, but what we are looking at is individuals that have to be 16 years of, of age or older. Um, they must be able to provide informed consent 
um, at least in the early states when we were, um, we now have enough safety data that we've now actually received approval to also start um, recruiting individuals that are unconscious at the time of arrival to the hospital. Um, they must have had an acute non-penetrating cervical or thoracic spinal cord injury um, and the, uh, the AAS grade on admission has to be A, B um, or C. The main criteria, and this is obviously a little bit of a bottleneck, is that because we want to maximize our chances to at least get some exploratory data of an effect, um, is that we want to initiate the treatment within 12 hours of injury. Um, and of course, we also want to see um, any spinal surgery or decompression done um, as quickly as possible, uh, but certainly the protocol stipulates that it must be done uh, within 24 hours. <clears throat> So um, we are aiming to recruit up to 20 individuals um, into the treatment arm. We are just under two years in, um, and we've got 13 uh, participants to date. Um, 11 of these have been males, um, two females. Uh, we've had nine cervical injuries and four um, thoracic injuries to date. So all of these individuals have tolerated this treatment very well. Um, we've had individuals that were basically treated on the time of injury. Some of them, the treatment was initiated whilst they were going into surgery or during surgery. Uh, and sometimes in some cases when the surgery was done, performed very quickly, uh, the treatment was even initiated um, after the surgery. Um, so there's been no uh, serious adverse events so far that we can see, uh, but obviously one of the things that we're predominantly interested in, particularly with IVIG therapy, um, is that it carries a risk of thrombo thromboembolic events, um, and that's obviously also a risk factor in spinal cord injury. So uh, that's also what we powered our study on to see whether um, there is any increased incidence of, that, of those uh, adverse events um, in this patient group. Um, so feasibility, um, as I already indicated, we think it's absolutely feasible. Um, in terms of the pharmacokinetics, uh, the data that we have so far um, is um, showing that we see this very profound peak um, in serum um, immunoglobulin levels, which is obviously what we would expect um, following um, intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. What you can also see is that obviously this is a real effect because of the infusion, not just because of the spinal cord injury. You can see here that if you look at individuals that were not treated, um, that typically the immunoglobulin levels drop during that first week, so these are IgG levels, um, and that sort of obviously correlates with that drop in the lymphocyte numbers that we see, um, and that you can see that now once sort of after the dotted line, so when the treatment was initiated, um, that we get this massive surge um, in serum immunoglobulin levels, so that's a nice sort of surrogate biomarker that we can use um, as to what the half-life of this drug is. So similar to what we see, you can see that after about 21 days, we are about halfway through to where we would normally be. Um, so that's very consistent with what we would normally expect the half-life of intravenous immunoglobulin therapy to be. Um, and now to come full circle to where we started off, um, is that I showed you at the beginning that we see this typically this very exacerbated neutrophilia um, in these patients. And what we consistently see so far, it more pronounced in some than in others, um, is that with IVIG therapy, the circulating neutrophil numbers seem to be coming down um, very rapidly uh, to within the normal reference range. So obviously they are outside of the normal reference range on admission uh, before treatment, but once the treatment has been given, uh, they get back within the normal reference range uh, seemingly much quicker, and obviously we need to do proper stats on this, uh, but it's already indicating that this difference is significant um, following um, IVIG therapy, and hopefully that's a sign um, of good things to come based on what I've shown you about the role of neutrophils um, in relation to pathology. So in summary then, um, what I have shown you today is that blood neutrophil and lymphocyte numbers uh, may have some diagnostic or prognostic value um, in relation to the severity of SCI as well as patient recovery. There's obviously a lot more work that needs to be done there and a lot more prognostic um, studies to be carried out. Um, that key features of the systemic inflammatory response uh, that we see in human patients um, are recapitulated in the mouse models that we use, uh, and that overall our findings support the view uh, that the inflammatory response, including the systemic changes that we see, um, negatively interferes with recovery um, from spinal cord injury and is therefore really um, a very um, valid therapeutic target um, in my view.
Um, the preclinical studies that we will use the IVIG, um, what I showed you is that the IVIG therapy improves, significantly improves outcomes, not just functionally, uh, but also anatomically, which I think is of most relevance when we think about translation, um, that it is superior to, um, to albumin therapy, um, and also that um, it has a very potent attenuating effect um, on the inflammatory response, uh, in particular um, activation of the complement system. And then lastly, obviously what we just talked about is in relation to our trial, um, is that IVIG therapy um, is certainly feasible in the acute phase of SCI, and by all accounts what we have so far um, appears very safe, um, that the half-life is about three weeks, so that's, in, uh, in, that's very normal to what we would expect, uh, and also that we may already have some attenuating effects um, of this IVIG therapy on the acute um, systemic response um, to spinal cord injury. So with that, um, I would really like to thank the people um, that have been involved in this work um, in relation to the preclinical work, in particular Tricia Yogia, who is an MD, PhD student in my lab, Faith Brennan, who is a former PhD student, now a postdoc in Phil Popovich's lab at OSU, um, uh, our um, industry collaborators at CSL Bering, particularly Fabian Kaiserman and Adrian Zucker, um, Gail Williams for her support in relation to biostatistics, um, and then our clinical um, partners, in particular Kate Campbell, who is the spine specialist at PA and the lead clinical PI, um, Esther Jacobson, who is my clinical trial coordinator, um, and then, of course, the head of the spinal injuries unit, Sridhara Tress, um, the other specialist there, um, Emily Gollan, who is one of the advanced physiotherapists, um, who is uh, doing all of the functional assessment in these individuals, uh, and last but not least, also Jan Swab um, for all his advice and input uh, along the way. And last but not least, of course, the funding agencies, uh, particularly the Wings for Life Foundation for making this work possible uh, and effectively enabling this work now to be translated um, into the clinic um, via a grant from CSL Bering uh, and also the support from Spinal Cure Australia and NHMRC that we have received over the years for the various projects uh, that I presented data on today. Thank you very much for your attention.